I've said this before uh, in, in talking about Old and New Testament, especially when you're in the Old Testament, that regardless of where you are in your Bible, when it comes to understanding and rightly interpreting the scriptures to knowing what's going on in, in really any passage of the Bible, all roads lead back to Torah. All roads lead back to those first all-important five books of your Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the law of Moses. And as we think about the book of 1 Kings, really, this book is no different. All roads lead back to Torah. Let me just direct your attention to Deuteronomy chapter 17. We'll begin our study there because we'll see that long before there was even a king, Moses predicted that this day would come, that they would demand a king in Israel. So Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 14. Here's what Moses writes to the people shortly before his death. When you enter the land which Yahweh your God gives you, and you possess it and live in it, and you say, I will set a king over me like all the nations who are around me, you shall surely set a king over you whom Yahweh your God chooses. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over yourselves. You may not put a foreigner over yourselves who is not your brother. Moreover, you shall not multiply, he, excuse me, he, that king, shall not multiply horses for himself, nor shall he cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. Yahweh has said to you, you shall never again return that way. And he shall not multiply wives for himself, or else his heart will turn away, nor shall he greatly increase silver and gold for himself." In, in the law of Moses here, we see that Moses is just assuming that they will demand a king for themselves. That day, as we've already talked about, comes finally in 1 Samuel 8.5. 1 Samuel 8.5. Just turn there. And we'll see that Moses, even as he quoted the people long beforehand, being a prophet predicted the very words, the very language that they would use when they demand a king. So in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 5, this is all the elders of Israel. They're gathered together. They come to Samuel at Ramah, verse 5, and they said to him, Behold, you have grown old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations." But the thing was evil in the sight of Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to Yahweh. Then Yahweh said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. So this day finally came in Samuel's lifetime. They demanded a king. And that king, first king, ended up being Saul, and then he was followed by David. This was ultimately a rejection, not of the current leadership of the day, but this was a rejection ultimately of God. To reject God as king and desire to be like the surrounding nations, though they were explicitly called to the contrary. Everything about Israel's law was creating a separation between them and the nations. That was a God-created separation. They want to do away in a great way with that separation and become like the other nations in demanding a ruler. So by the time that David's reign ends, this is where we find ourselves at the beginning of the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings picks up at the end of David's life. Not surprisingly, there is a, another coup 
by one of David's sons to try and take the throne and subvert Solomon becoming king, even though it was well known that Solomon would be that king. And he even has prominent leaders, uh, David's own general and high priest at the time, joining in the coup to overthrow David and avoid Solomon's rule. And so this is where the book of 1 Kings picks up. A clear glimpse of Israel's continued stubbornness, continued rebellion against God, overthrowing, seeking to overthrow God's own king. And this is where we pick up in the history of the nation. Just a little bit about the, the book of First Kings, or rather the books of First and Second Kings. These were initially one book. And one author uh, notes just something about the composition of this book and how it comes down to us as First and Second Kings. He, he writes this, the Alexandrian Jews brought both Samuel and kings together as books of kingdoms and then subdivided each of them so as to form four books of kingdoms. The Latin Vulgate, this would have been Jerome, a uh, contemporary of uh, Augustine. He wrote the Latin Vulgate. The Latin Vulgate in the course of time dropped the term books of kingdoms and shifting to the Hebrew division between Samuel and Kings, came out with the titles that the Western church, that's us, has employed ever since. It was not until 1517 that the Hebrew Bible made the partition of Samuel and Kings into two books. So the way we have these books separately divided as uh, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, is really only something like 500 years old. Uh, this is why if you go back in history, and maybe if you've talked to enough atheists or skeptics, they've challenged the number of books in the canon. Um, well, you can easily account for a different number because they were just divided differently. <laughs> so you take these four books that we count as four and reduce them down to two or depending what era of history, one, and then you get a different number, but it's the same material in the, in the different number of books, just counted differently. You take the 12 minor prophets, put them all into one book called the 12, and then you're lacking another 11 books, it seems, but the content's still the same. So the division, at least as we have it, is a somewhat modern uh, division but still the same content, uh, all inspired by God himself, all written through the prophets. When it comes to the very prophet or prophets that wrote this book, the author doesn't name himself. It's uh, pretty much unknown who authored First Kings. Uh, scholars try and narrow this down to one or a handful of authors that compile the writings. It is clear that there are other writings that may have contributed to the book because within 1 Kings, you have other writings that we don't possess today just mentioned. The Chronicles, not the Book of Chronicles, but some document called the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel is, is mentioned as well as a couple other writings that we don't now have access to. But the Jewish Talmud attributed the book to Jeremiah as a, a particular prophet. Let me just show you perhaps why this is attributed to Jeremiah. If you consider that Kings was one single volume, just fast forward to the end of Second Kings, which would have just been the end of the book of Kings, and just notice how it ends. So this takes us all the way up to the period of the exile. And so you have 2 Kings 25, the last chapter of the book of Kings. Follow along as I read verse 27, 2 Kings 25, verse 27 to the end. 
and we'll notice a similarity between this and what Jeremiah wrote. 2 Kings 25, 27 reads, Now it happened in the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the 12th month on the 27th day of the month, notice the specificity there, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he became king, lifted up the head of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from prison. And he spoke to him good words, and he set his throne above the throne of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiakim changed his prison clothes and had his meals in the king's presence continually all the days of his life. And for his allowance, a continual allowance was given him by the king, a portion for each day, all the days of his life. So Jehoiakim, the governor at the time in Judah, gets removed and brought to Babylon. This king gets brought there, and then eventually, before his life ends, he's removed from prison and then exalted above all the other rulers in Babylon during the exile. It's tremendous favor being shown to God's people, even in the midst of a pagan nation. But just notice the similarity in Jeremiah 52. This is the end of Jeremiah, Jeremiah's prophecy. And it ends very similarly, starting in verse 31 of Jeremiah chapter 52. Now it happened in the 37th year of the exile, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 25th of the month, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the first year of his reign, lifted up the head of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and brought him out of prison. And he spoke to him good words, and he set his throne above the thrones of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiakim changed his prison clothes and had his meals in the king's presence continually all the days of his life. For his allowance, a continual allowance was given him by the king of Babylon, a daily portion all the days of his life until the day of his death. So it's seen almost verbatim, two sections of scripture, two books of scripture, ending almost the exact same way. And so some attribute this to Jeremiah. Jeremiah doesn't name himself. Uh, It would have been odd for him to not be included in these books of First and Second Kings uh, if he was the author playing such a prominent role as a prophet in Israel's history. But nevertheless, uh, Hebrew tradition attributes him with likely being the writer. Regardless of, of whether we know who wrote it or not, you have other books in your Bible who don't have a clear author as well. Even a New Testament book as prominent as Hebrews not named, and and no specific author. We do know that this is inspired by God, just as all the other biblical books. And it has, since it was inspired by God, intentional purpose behind it. And so I want to give you that now, the purpose of this inspired book of Scripture. You could summarize the purpose of First and Second Kings, and again, I'm considering that one book, the purpose of Kings is this. First and Second Kings preserves the inspired record of Israel's history from the time of its greatest glory to its eventual demise. Kings preserves the inspired record of Israel's history from the time of its greatest glory to its eventual demise. It does this in a unique way, even though, in, as we'll see in coming weeks, First and Second Chronicles is similar as it chronicles many of the same events, the same time frame. First and Second Kings does this in a unique way because seemingly this was written just uh, up into the, the exile. And so you get a divine recounting either just uh, before or shortly into the time that the nations have been, the nation's been exiled. So they're no longer in Israel. They're in Babylon. But you get this God-inspired history, um, this recounting, which really gives us ultimately God's own opinion, uh, his own interpretation of 
his people's history. And that's going to be key as we get the divine perspective on what's happening by events. You have uh, over 400 years just truncated down to uh, what some have noted is about 50,000 words. So 400 years in that many words, which means that the author and what he did include is being very particular with the information that he decided to include. It's a lot of history to get whittled down all the way to uh, that many words. You think about uh, American history, you get tomes and tomes, volumes uh, of just the, the Civil War, right? Or unique periods of American history. Well, this is a lot of Israel's history in really what's a few words. Now, as you've read this on your Bible reading plan, perhaps it may not have felt like a few words, but it, on the whole, if you step back, it's not that much for that much history. And so it bears asking the question, why is this author including these events? Why is he including these events in what he does include? Why pick these? Why mention these? Why repeat the things that we see mentioned here? You should be asking that question, by the way, whenever you come across a a portion of scripture, you can sort of discover the significance of wherever you are in your Bible by asking, why did he say this? Why did he say this at this place? Why include these details at this moment in the flow? What's the connection? Uh, We'll discover something of of those questions, answer some of those as we look at 1 Kings tonight. Just a brief outline, if you wanted to divide Kings, 1st and 2nd Kings, into one single outline, you could do it this way. First, the golden era, chapters 1 through 11, recall the golden era in Israel's history. The nation never ascended higher than what we read at the opening of 1st Kings. They are the world power. The other Other nations bring tribute to them. Everyone is looking to them as an example of preeminent wisdom and wealth. So these first 11 chapters are the golden era in Israel's history. And then following, you get the divided kingdom at enmity, and then thirdly, the divided kingdom at peace the divided kingdom at enmity, and then the the divided kingdom at peace. After this golden era, in chapter 12, under Solomon's son Rehoboam, the nations divided 10 to 2, all the other tribes to Judah and Benjamin. And those, there's an obviousness to the, the wars that the Kingdom of Israel, the northern nation, the ten tribes, the wars that they have continually with the southern nation, Judah and Benjamin. And that will be chapters 12 to 16 in 1 Kings. But then you have a period of the divided kingdom at peace. We can't seem to take over each other, and so let's just let bygones be bygones. We'll be content to be separate And really, the divided kingdom at peace takes you from 1 Kings chapter 16, the middle of 16, verse 29, basically, of 1 Kings 16, all the way into 2 Kings 9, that ends in verse 37. You have the divided kingdom at peace and what's happening in the nation during that time when they're not warring with each other. And then the final two ways to think about the division of this book is the decline and fall of Israel, the northern kingdom. So that's 2 Kings 10 through 17. You get the decline and fall of Israel in particular. And then you have the author honing in on the remaining days, really, which is the kingdom after the fall of Samaria. The kingdom after the fall of Samaria. And that takes you from 2 Kings 18 all the way through chapter 25, the end of the book, as we 
as we read. So the golden era, the divided kingdom at enmity, the divided kingdom at peace. Number four, the decline and fall of Israel. And then five, the fifth division, the kingdom after the fall of Samaria. So that's a basic um, outline of the book. Let me just show you a few things to notice uh, in this golden era when Solomon reigned. Solomon comes to the throne in chapter 2. Chapter 2 begins with the death of David, then David's time, verse 1, to die drew near. So he commanded Solomon, his son, saying, I am going the way of all the earth. So you shall be strong and be a man, and you shall keep the responsibility given by Yahweh your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies according to what is written in the law of Moses that you may be prosperous in all that you do and wherever you turn. As the kingdom is being handed over by David uh, to King Solomon, he's got not only uh, a continuation of the Davidic monarchy in mind, David doesn't, but just notice what he's calling him back to, all the way back to the law of Moses. All roads lead to Torah. You never get beyond the Torah in your Bible. This is another good example of that. Verse 4, the goal was that Yahweh may establish his promise, which he spoke concerning me, David says, saying, if your sons keep their way and walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, he said, you shall not have a man cut off from the throne of Israel. And then he goes on to give him other instructions practically with what to do with some of these rebels who have uh, persisted, whom David's allowed to live. (laughs) David's merciful and yet just at the same time, good picture of uh, the ultimate king who would come. Rebels would experience mercy, but ultimately in the end would experience his justice And then Solomon solidly establishes his kingdom. He solidly establishes his kingdom. Fast forward to chapter 3, and we see something happening to King Solomon post-ascension that has happened to other prophets uh, in Solomon's lifetime, or excuse me, in uh, biblical revelation up to this point, which is Yahweh appearing and speaking to him. So chapter 3, verse 5, In Gibeon, Yahweh appeared to Solomon in a dream at night, and God said, Ask what I should should give to you. This is a classic prophetic fashion that Yahweh not only speaks at times, but here, as, as, as at other times, He is appearing. That is a visible manifestation of some kind. And in this particular instance, that comes in a dream. So Solomon has in this dream interaction with God. Verse 6, then Solomon said, You have shown great loving kindness to your slave David, my father, according to how he walked before you in truth and righteousness and uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great loving kindness that you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. So now, O Yahweh, my God, you have made your slave king in place of my father, David. Yet I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your slave is in the midst of your people, which you have chosen, a numerous people who are too many to be numbered or counted. So give your slave a listening heart to judge your people to discern between good and evil for who is able to judge this glorious people of yours. This is Solomon's request for uh, one thing above all else, and that is wisdom to function as judge. You remember when the people demanded a king, they wanted a king for this explicit purpose, to judge them, to rule and decide a matter among them. And so Solomon recognizes, I need wisdom to do that. Verse 10 says, this thing was pleasing in the sight of the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And so God tells him in verse 11, 
because you have asked this thing and have not asked for yourself long life, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have you asked for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself discernment to listen to justice, Behold, I have done according to your words. Behold, I have given you a wise and discerning heart so that there has been no one like you before you, nor shall one like you arise after you. I have also given to you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there will not be any among the kings like you all your days. God gave Solomon what he didn't ask for because of what he did ask for. And just notice how Solomon repeats this lesson to be learned by all subsequent generations in Proverbs 3. In Proverbs 3, he passes this same lesson that he learned from God there on to his son. Verse 1 says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. So Solomon's passing on wisdom, wise words to his son. And just like God gave Solomon these things, long life, riches, um, honor, wealth, he tells his son, long life belongs to you if you heed my wise words. Um, He reiterates something similar in verse 13. How blessed is the man who finds wisdom and the man who obtains discernment. For her profit is better than the profit of silver and her produce better than fine gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed. So access to these other beneficial things are uh, the possession of the one who seeks wisdom. And Solomon, in seeking wisdom and asking for wisdom, first and foremost, is given these other things, long life, wealth, etc., This is not the last time that God appears to Solomon uh, in chapter 3. One more time he appears in chapter 9. This is after the completion of the building of the temple. After Solomon prays that great prayer in chapter 8. Chapter 9, verse 1 says, Now it happened when Solomon had completed the building, building the house of Yahweh and the king's house and all that Solomon desired to do, that Yahweh appeared to Solomon a second time as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. And Yahweh said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication, which you have made before me. I have set apart as holy this house, which you have built by putting my name there forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. As for you, if you will walk before me as your father David walked in integrity of heart and uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded you and will keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever, just as I promised your father David, saying, you shall not have a man cut off from the throne of Israel. But if you or your sons indeed turn away from following me and do not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have given before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them and the house which I have set apart as holy for my name, I will cast out of my presence. So Israel will become a proverb and a byword among all the peoples. And as you know, this, this eventually does happen, even as Solomon himself turns away Uh, from the Lord in in subsequent chapters. So just notice uh, for one moment in verse 3, the prayer that Solomon prayed, which I wish we had time to, to look at it thoroughly, we don't, but Solomon is praying after the house is built that this location of Jerusalem 
and especially this hill, Zion, uh, where the temple itself stood, will possess an enduring importance in the history of Israel. So when God says in chapter 9 that he's heard the prayer, um, that he has essentially favorably granted what Solomon's praying, in verse 3, he says that he's done this very thing. He set apart the house that Solomon built by putting his name there, and he's done that forever. And he says his eyes and heart will be there perpetually. This is why if you fast forward to what we've been talking so much about recently, uh, the, the coming kingdom, biblically you trace that theme of the kingdom out, and where is the kingdom uh, headed from. The, the Messiah's kingdom spreads across the entire earth, but the capital is this place, Jerusalem. You could read Zechariah uh, chapter 6, and it says that the one who's coming will rebuild the temple. He will rebuild the temple. He'll function as prophet and king in that temple, and he'll even enlist the Gentiles to participate in the building of of that kingdom that'll sit on the same location. Uh, If you went to Jerusalem, you would see the Temple Mount is that all-important place where God has set his heart and his eyes forever. So one day, the Dome of the Rock won't be there. Uh, It will be a rebuilt temple with Jesus himself reigning there. This was all a part of, of Solomon's prayer. In this uh, time in the nation, we just get a glimpse of the prominence of Israel at this time under the leadership of Solomon. So in this golden era, if you just fast forward to chapter 10, that famous story of the Queen of Sheba, her coming to investigate the things that she's heard. Notice in verse 1, the Queen of Sheba heard the report about Solomon concerning the name of Yahweh. So she came to test him with riddles. This is really Israel functioning at her best. The nations hear about Solomon, the king, but not for Solomon's sake. They hear the report about Solomon concerning what in particular, and it's this, the name of Israel's God, the name of Yahweh. Through Solomon and through the nation of Israel, the wisdom that's been granted to him as this monarch and the nation are functioning on all cylinders at this period in Israel's history, what's happening is that God's name is being made famous. That was the point. It's working. Jump over to verse 4. When she makes this visit, the queen of Sheba saw all the wisdom of Solomon and the house that he had built, the food at his table, the seating of his servants, the disposition of his attendants and their attire, his cupbearers and his stairway by which he went up to the house of Yahweh. All of this has to do with a wise exercising of authority as everything under Solomon's rule is rightly ordered down to the artistic and architectural feats of his day, all of that just screams wisdom from those who see it, who get to experience the nation at this time. And look at this other ruler's response at the end of verse 5. When she beholds all of this, there is no more spirit or breath in her. She is left breathless at the wisdom manifest in Solomon's kingdom. This will be when when Solomon's son, David's son, comes to rule, those who inherit the kingdom when Jesus rules, we will be left breathless in a similar way as we watch his wise authority exercised across absolutely every facet of life at the time. 
This is the point. And so it's working. Again, all roads lead back to Torah, right? Flip back to Deuteronomy 4 as you just hold your place there. Deuteronomy 4. And we'll see that this is the very intention behind God's giving of the law through Moses. Verse 1, So now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I am teaching you to do, so that, purpose statement, you will live and go in and take possession of the land which Yahweh, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of Yahweh your God, which I am commanding you. No alteration of God's words, so that you can keep keep it just as he, he gave it to you, so that you'll take possession of the land. Verse 3, your eyes have seen what Yahweh has done in the case of Baal Peor. For all the men who walked after Baal Peor, Yahweh your God has destroyed them from among you. But you who clung to Yahweh your God are alive today, every one of you. See, I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as Yahweh my God commanded me, that you should do thus in the land where you are entering to possess it. The law was intended to be exercised, obeyed in the land. Notice verse 6, the result of what's supposed to happen as the people keep the law in the land, like they're doing in Solomon's day. You shall keep and do them, for that is your wisdom. First use of that term in the, in the Bible. For that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the people's who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. This was the result of Israel heeding God's wisdom. And that's up to this point what is absolutely happening so that the queen of Sheba visits and she is left breathless and virtually saying this very same thing. This, I can't believe the wisdom that I'm experiencing. She says that even the report I heard didn't accurately capture everything that I've, I've seen. Notice at the end of verse, uh, at the end of chapter 10, it wasn't just the queen of Sheba doing this, doing this. She wasn't the only one seeking out Solomon. Verse 23, 1 Kings 10. So King Solomon became greater than all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. And all the earth was seeking the presence of Solomon. All the earth was seeking the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. And they brought every man his present, articles of silver and gold, garments, weapons, spices, horses, and mules, a set amount year by year. And Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen, and he had 1,400 chariots, 12,000 horsemen, and stationed them in the chariot cities and with the kings in Jerusalem. It says the king also made silver as plentiful as stones in Jerusalem, and he made cedars as plentiful as sycamore trees that are in the Shephelah. So silver at this time is so abundant, it says, common as rocks in that day. This was indeed the golden era of Israel's history. In chapter 11, we quickly encounter Solomon's turning away from Yahweh. Verse 1, King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which Yahweh had said, To the sons of Israel, you shall not go along with them, nor shall they go along with you, for they will surely turn your heart away after other gods, or after their gods. Solomon, though, clung to these in love. How many? He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, something less than wives. And his wives turned his heart away. His wives turned his heart away. So this brings us into the uh, next section of the book. 
is that you have the divided kingdom at enmity. So for David's sake, the division of the kingdom is put off. But when Rehoboam takes the throne because of Solomon's sin and due to Rehoboam's folly, the nation's divided. And both those things are important. This was a consequence for Solomon's sin, but it wasn't apart from Rehoboam's folly. And so the, the nation is divided due to Rehoboam's foolish decision to listen to his young friends instead of the older, wiser counsel, counselors of Solomon, you know, men who got to walk with the wisest man who ever lived, learn from him, sit at his feet, watch him navigate complex situations and watch him judge. They gave good counsel to a young man and he threw it off for inexperienced, foolish counselors. There's a lesson in that. Listen to age, listen to wisdom. When the nation is divided, uh, this begins a consistent feud between the nation of Israel and the nation of what becomes known as, as Judah. One of the adversaries that God raised up against Solomon in chapter 11, verse 26, Jeroboam, is made a similar promise actually to King David. And Jeroboam is promised this enduring kingdom, even though he would preserve a portion of the kingdom for David. Jeroboam, separate from David, is promised a kingdom if he would only keep God's commandments and his statutes, just be faithful. Of course, as we know, he doesn't do that. In fact, in chapter 12, not only does he fail to keep the commandments of Yahweh, but Jeroboam, at the end of chapter 12, we have documented for us just the extent to which he went in contradicting God's law. He essentially forms his own religion. Verse 28 says that he makes two golden calves, idols, which was forbidden by the law. He puts them at the northernmost portion in Dan of Israel and the southernmost portion of the region just above Judah in Bethel so that wherever you were in the middle of the nation, you were closer to worshiping one of those idols than you were to the temple. And so that was strategic of his to keep the people from going back to Jerusalem that place that God had set his heart and his eyes and his temple. He creates in verse 32 a special feast days, so holy days, holidays, as a part of this new system. He makes new priests in verse 31 who are not of the tribe of Levi, and he makes his own altar in verse 33. So he's got his own gods, his own priesthood, his own holidays, his own altar. This is an entirely new religion. And as you keep reading through 1 Kings and 2 Kings, it talks about how they, the kings of Israel cling to the sins of Jeroboam. So this is consistently a snare. This whole religion that he constructed, Israel never really leaves that. They never have any kings who are wholly devoted to God. And so they experience the exile first. There, there are several themes that, that appear for us in, in the book of 1 Kings. The temple is, is one of them. Uh, in chapters 5 through 9, basically, you have the temple. It, it's just a prominent theme. Everything that happens with the temple, the construction, the amount of work that went into it, the kinds of metals that were used, how Solomon fashioned the beauty and glory of it. If you wanted, you could mathematically uh, figure out just the weight of the different materials that were used if you cared to do the, the tedious work of um, figuring out the dimensions and the metals that were used. We have that kind of detail. 
but really all of those details from the ornate engravements to the materials being used to the height and thickness, all of those dimensions, uh, really what we have for us is the glory of the temple being described. We're, we're intended to grasp something of the glory of the temple that Solomon built so that we would know uh, just how prominent and spectacular it would have been. And then you see the, the prominence of the, the temple itself continuing as God's people in Judah worship there, and then even as people in Israel uh, remember the legacy of the temple, prominently as, as we saw in Jeroboam, he's afraid that people would go back to Jerusalem. And so Jerusalem, even in his mind, we recognize the, the prominence of it. So the temple continually comes up. That's a theme that emerges from it. But then you have two other prominent themes that are repeated, and that's the kings and the prophets, the kings and the prophets. The kings just in 1 Kings that are, that are noted include Solomon, his son Rehoboam, Jeroboam, who becomes the first king of Israel specifically. You have Abijam and Asa, kings of Judah, Nadab, Basha, Elah, Zimri, Amri, Ahab, all kings of Israel. And then the book ends with uh, Jehoshaphat being the king of Judah and Ahaziah being the king of Israel. Those are the kings recounted for us in the book of First Kings. You also have prophets begin to take a more prominent role in the canon. Uh, schools of prophets are mentioned before this. Prominent prophets like Moses or Joshua are obviously mentioned. But it's just interesting to note the amount of time that's spent on the prophets as a category and then specifically the v variety of prophets all mentioned in the book of First Kings. It's almost like the book starts off talking about the kings, but then we just keep seeing prophets appear, uh, some named by name, others not given any name. Let me just give you a list. You have almost as many prophets mentioned as kings in the book of First Kings. So you have Ahijah, as one, I'm not counting Nathan, he was a, a prophet for David, extended into Solomon's reign. But you have Ahijah, Shemaiah, you have in chapter 13, a man of God mentioned who's a prophet. You have an old prophet mentioned in the same chapter. Then you have Elijah coming on the scene in chapter 17. You have Elisha being consecrated, anointed as a prophet in chapter 19. You have a different prophet mentioned in chapter 20, another man of God, that being a term for the prophets in chapter 20, verse 28. You have another prophet mentioned in chapter 20 called a certain man of the sons of the prophets. He's a prophet too. And then you have my favorite prophet, Micaiah in chapter 22, and that's when the, where the book ends uh, with that prophet. One thing that you see happening over and over and over again with these prophets is their pursuit, or you could say God's pursuit, of the kings and the people through these men. God is continually pursuing his people through these men, these prophets. Let me just show you real quick, chapter 20, verse 13. If you just notice the order, the kings are not coming to the prophets usually. The prophets are coming to the kings. And that's a problem. Why are the kings not seeking God? Why are they not looking for God's word? God's word has to come to them, has to seek them out. This should not be. Notice chapter 20, verse 13. Now behold, a prophet approached Ahab, king of Israel, and said, thus says Yahweh. A prophet approached Ahab. In verse 22, then the prophet came near to the king of Israel and said to him, 
Verse 28, then a man of God came near and spoke to the king of Israel and said, thus says Yahweh. Verse 38, so the prophet walked away and stood by for the king by the way and disguised himself with a bandage over his eyes. Now it happened that as the king was passing by, he cried out to the king and said, chapter 21, verse 18, Or verse 17, then the word of Yahweh came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone down to take possession of it. And you shall speak to him saying, Thus says Yahweh, etc. You see, the prophets are constantly seeking out the kings and the kings just don't want anything to do with the prophets. This comes to a, a a prominent head at the very end of the book in chapter 20. And we see just very clearly why the kings are not seeking the prophets. Jehoshaphat, in a sinful alliance with Ahab, says in verse 7, chapter 22, verse 7, is there not yet a prophet of Yahweh here that we may inquire of him? Good question. Here's Ahab's response. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, there is yet one man by whom we may inquire of Yahweh, but I hate him because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. He is Micaiah, son of Imla. But Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. So why aren't they seeking the prophets? Because they hate the prophets. Because the prophets don't have anything good to say to them in their rebellion. This is why the prophets have to constantly come to them. But this is a gracious act of God to still pursue his kings, to seek them out. Even though, as the book ends here, as it's divided in our English Bibles, the king ends up putting Micaiah to death. Verse 27, thus says the king, put this man in prison and feed him sparingly, uh, literally bread of affliction, until I come back safely. And then Micaiah boldly tells him, if you indeed return safely, Yahweh has not spoken by me. Listen, all you people. And so he knows he's going to prison to die, to be kept alive for some time until the king can come back safely from battle but Micaiah knows he's not coming back safely from battle. And that's how, uh, essentially, this book ends with the persecution of this prophet and the appointment of another wicked king, Ahaziah, to reign over Israel. Real quickly, as we, as we close here, there are several lessons that emerge from us, uh, for us from the pages of 1 Kings, um, we could have just the simple, obvious lessons like it matters who you marry, right? If you're learning from Solomon, it matters who you marry. Marry in the Lord, you singles. Uh, You could note God's mercy to Gentiles as God sends his prophets away from Israel to a poor widow to be sustained as the prophet comes to her. God even has mercy on her to keep her alive by replenishing food, miraculously so. God resurrects her son as an act of mercy. And all of this only happens among the Gentiles. And you'll remember in Luke 4, the Jews' reaction to hearing about that again, being reminded of their own history. Don't you love the the Bible? No. We hate hearing about that, just like Ahab hated hearing from the prophets. Fast forward to the New Testament, it's the same people hating hearing from God. You're stubborn, the Gentiles will receive mercy, and that invokes a similar response as it did from King Ahab against Jesus. Kill him. And they attempted to throw him off a cliff. 
Another lesson that, that we could learn is that God's fear is our wisdom. God's fear is our wisdom. The fear of the Lord is our wisdom. You want to be wise, then set your eyes on the glory of God to stand in awe of him, to live a life in subjection to his authority. That is a fear of God, and that is your wisdom. To the degree that we veer from the fear of God, we act and think and live foolishly. To the degree that we cling to the fear of God, we act wisely and well. I think that all of the lessons in 1 Kings are eclipsed by these two. Let me just give you two lessons that I think eclipse all others. As we encounter prophets who fail continually and kings who fail continually, two truths become obvious. Israel needs a better prophet. Israel needs a better king. A better prophet and a better king are the greatest needs of Israel. I love the details that are included. You get a long story that occurs in chapter 13. Um, I got to to preach that in the Blood for Clarity series and Equipping Hour, if you haven't heard that. What's all that's going on in 1 Kings 13? You can go back and listen there. But even then, the prophets proved to be fallible men. One's a liar. One clings to the truth, but not always. We need a better prophet. And Israel needs a better king. A better king than Solomon, who was only halfway devoted to the Lord, who failed tremendously. And then all the subsequent kings who follow in the same errors as the kings who come before, idolatrous kings, immoral kings. Solomon himself looked forward to a better king. And I'll just close with this. Go to Psalm 72, and I'll show you Solomon even looked forward to a different day, a better king, when even his kingdom in all its glory would be eclipsed by a better king and greater glory than Solomon could even point to in his own day. This is one of the Psalms written by King Solomon. That's in your title of Solomon. And as he prays this prayer for the king, it becomes clear as you keep reading in Psalm 72 that he does not have merely himself in mind but one greater than him who will bring a greater kingdom. O God, give the king your judgments and your righteousness to the king's son. A different king, a son of the king. May he render judgment to your people with righteousness and your afflicted with justice. Let the mountains lift up peace to the people and the hills in righteousness. May he give justice to the afflicted of the people, save the children of the needy, and crush the oppressor. In Ecclesiastes, Solomon notes that injustice and oppression still exist in his day. So this, he's looking to a different day. Verse 5, let them fear you while the sun endures and as long as the moon from generation to all generations. May he come down like rain upon the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. May the righteous flourish in his days and abundance of peace until the moon is no more. May he also have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Solomon did not have that kind of dominion. Let the desert creatures kneel before him and his enemies lick the dust. Again, two other signs of a day that did not belong to Solomon. Creatures in perfect subjection? Nope. In chapter 13 of 1 Kings, you have creatures eating Israelites still, and enemies raised up against Solomon. 
So verse 9 is not Solomon's day. Verse 10, let the kings of Tarshish and all the coastlands bring a present. The kings of Sheba and Seba offer tribute. In his day, there was a queen of Sheba, not a king. And let all kings bow down, verse 11, to him. All nations serve him. For he will deliver the needy when he cries for help, the afflicted also, and let him who has no helper, and him who has no helper. He will have compassion on the poor and needy, and the lives of the needy he will save. He will redeem their life from oppression and violence, and their blood will be precious in his sight. So may he live. And may they give to him the gold of Sheba and let each pray for him continually. Let each bless him all day long. May there be abundance of grain in the earth on top of the mountains. That's not usually where grain grows. Certainly not in abundance. One day it will. May its fruits, may its fruit wave like the cedars of Lebanon, and may those from the city blossom like vegetation of the earth. May his name endure forever. May his name increase as long as the sun shines. Let all nations be blessed in him. Let all nations call him blessed. Blessed be Yahweh. God, the God of Israel, who alone works wondrous deeds, and blessed be his glorious name, and may the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are completed. Let me pray. God, thank you for a glimpse of uh, the kingdom that once was and for the one that is coming when you will receive perfect praise in the person of Jesus, your son, your king, whom you have determined to set on your holy hill, Zion. And God, even as your people, the church, we pray that you would let your kingdom come, that you would let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven We pray that you, Lord Jesus, would come, that you would come quickly and make all things right for our joy and for your own glory. We pray this in your name. Amen.